Okay, so good morning and uh, today is the 10th lecture in our course and uh, so let me just remind you what we did. Uh, so last lecture we introduced, we were introduced to the Lagrangian formulation of classical mechanics and we saw that there were two simple situations when uh, when uh, it was easy to solve the equations of motion because there was a, a constant of motion and so you need to instead of doing two integrations we did only one so first one was when l was independent of the coordinate uh, q then the canonically conjugate momentum p which is defined this is the definition dl by dq dot is a constant okay and then p will there'll be some uh, expression in terms of q dot and you just hopefully you can solve it. Okay, second one was when L has no explicit depend on, on dependence on time. And then we saw that this combination P again, which is defined here, Q dot minus L is a constant and usually we call it energy. Okay. So what we're going to do today is first look at some applications of, uh, of these two ideas. And so we have first application is uh, going back to the Brachistochrone problem and uh, so here what we call uh, q is become z and time is x if you make this thing you can see that uh, it's uh, uh, it, it is uh, it maps on to a problem of a functional which depends uh, and if we call this thing which i have written in brackets as l so it's like a function of uh, z and z prime so the z here and z prime but the key point here is that there is no analog of time of which is x here okay so there is no this has no explicit dependence on time on x which is the analog of time here so what does it say it says that pz prime that is z prime is just uh, here z prime is this dz by dx okay so we have to first find out what is p p is defined to be dl by d z prime okay so you have to do a computer which be the answer from somewhere okay i mean it's a simple differentiation Second, let me just check d by dz prime, so 1 by square root. So this square is not there. Okay, so this is what we get. And we have to do, now we have to compute d z prime minus l and ask what is this. Okay, so if you do this computation, you'll see that this is equal to Something very, very, very nice. It is equal to minus one by some quantity d, which is really the denominator out here. So d is this quantity. D is defined to be this. Okay. So what is the statement that P Z prime prime is a constant of motion? Okay. By constant of motion we mean something which will, uh, if you give it, uh, if you, if you follow the trajectory along a uh, trajectory, it will give the same. It will be a constant. So, so what? Uh, uh, but uh, the thing is now it's minus one by d. So if P Z prime minus L is a constant of motion. So this implies that D is a constant of motion. And we can do even better. We can say D square is also a constant of motion. Okay, so we get something very nice. It says that Z A minus Z into 1 plus Z prime square equal to constant. Okay. 
Okay, we still need to do one more uh, integration to get Z as a function of X. But uh, I mean, this was actually, if you go back and I think we, this was, this was dated without proof. Okay. So I'll pause here. Are there any questions about what we did just now? So what we said is that we looked at this uh, thing and we made this identification that X is like time and Z is like Q. And uh, the object which I've circled in white is uh, this guy is uh, is like the Lagrangian. And so P Z prime minus L is a constant of motion. And there's some calculations which I didn't show. You first need to compute P. Okay, and then you'll find that it takes some simple form of something with a denominator. And that, so, so I took d squared because there's a square, ugly square root here. And then 2g, g is just acceleration due to gravity. These are all constants. So you just write z a minus z into 1 plus z prime square is a constant. Okay, so you see that there's a nice simplification. So this is application of uh, second uh, item here. But the same problem, we can do a little bit of a uh, uh, rewrite. So application two is, uh, okay, so we chose uh, in the above, in the back stock run problem. We chose uh, Z as a function of X. So X was the independent variable and Z was a dependent variable. We can exchange roles. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, that is, how, how did we conclude that PZ minus L is a uh, constant of motion? Uh, so that's what we proved last lecture. Okay, okay so this, I was just stating results from last lecture. So if L has no explicit dependence on time, then PQ dot minus L is a constant of motion. It's usually called it. So here, huh? this was there. Were you there last lecture? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is what we proved. I'm just using that. So I just now to make, do some little bit of translation. And in our problem, that just translates to PZ prime minus L. That P is given by the above formula here. So now what we're going to do is exchange these guys. And uh, so you, uh, does it require, we need to do a little bit of a computation now. Okay. And uh, so exercise. Okay. Show that. Now time will be a function of the functional of x of z. Okay. And that you can write as integral from a to b, d, t. No, I don't. I want to ensure this relation and write the answer. Okay. Which is not so hard. It's equal to dz a from z a to z b dz of So it's, it's not very hard. You just go back to this uh, original expression and uh, you just invert. So you just bring this dx inside. So you'll get dx squared plus dz whole square and pull out a dz and replace this thing. So the denominator will remain the same. But now you can see here, so in this setup, uh, you know, uh, z is like time. Okay. And x is like q. Okay, so now what we see here is that there is explicit time dependence, right? Z is like time. But however, what we see here is there is no dependence on Q. It's only a function of Q prime, that is X, X dx by dz. Okay, so now this functional is independent. 
of x. So what should be a constant of motion if it is independent of q? P corresponding to p. Yeah, so, so p which is now defined to be this by dx dot should be constant. Okay, so if you just go ahead and do the calculation, we get something simple. Okay, so if you go back and look, this is actually identical to what we got earlier because we can always switch the roles. So if you see this, uh, yeah, you can go back and you can prove that this is really the same what we have. Okay, so. Okay, so, so you can see that uh, it depends on what we, we exchange the role of independent and dependent variable and uh, this thing. Okay, so, so this is a uh, uh, second application where the role was slightly different. But anyway, so it's not like you got some new constant of motion. It's the same constant of motion, just really done in a slightly different way. Okay, so... Uh, any questions or comments? You know, the scariest part for a teacher or the best part for a teacher is when there's absolute silence. And, uh, you know, there are two possibilities when this happens. And uh, one is that everything is crystal clear and, you know, me, the teacher, I'm doing a fantastic job. And the other one is uh, people are not following anything. So I don't know where reality is. So, okay. So, so third example is uh, extremely trivial. We'll go back to classical mechanics. L equal to half m x dot square. Okay. This should have been my application one, but uh, I kind of. Uh, but I should do this later. So now this is uh, the Lagrangian is independent of x. So the canonically conjugate momentum. Let's put subscript here. Okay, so here is an example where what we called, uh, uh, you know, uh, linear momentum is indeed is coming out from this uh, general formulation. Okay, so this is the standard. Now, there's a, since it's independent of x, okay, so I just have some comment, uh, comment to make. Okay. Uh, when L is independent of, this is true for the general case itself, independent of some coordinate Q, okay, then uh, translations in Q that is if you take 
that is if you take q goes to q plus a that a is some constant okay leave the lagrangian as well as the action invariant in this case so okay such a thing we call it we have a name for this we'll call it symmetry this is a symmetry So just one more comment here is that I said that if Lagrangian is invariant, obviously action is invariant, but the converse need not be true. Action can be invariant, but Lagrangian may not be. So we actually only need the weaker condition, which is uh, that the action is invariant. So that's what we call a symmetry. Okay, so symmetry. So that's a beautiful uh, story. Symmetry of so not all symmetries will have this thing. So it is a symmetry with a continuous parameter. So here we have a a can a can vary continuously. It's not some discrete thing. Okay, symmetry. Uh, this implies that there's a conserved or constant of motion. Let's call it constant of motion. Okay, so in this case, uh, the canonically conjugate momentum is a constant of motion. And this is a very, very general story, and it's a... Uh, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So the continuous parameter means that A should be uh, varying continuously. Right? No, it can take it can take a continuum set of values. So A can take all real values. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. So sometimes it can be that, you know, it'll be plus A can be only, there'll be some symmetry where A can be only plus one and minus one. That won't, uh, that will not lead to uh, constant of motion. That's all I'm saying. And so this, uh, this is, uh, this, uh, this is, uh, goes under the name of, you know, this theorem. And, uh, no, there is M in author. It's a great mathematician, great mathematician. Okay, but uh, she belongs to an era when women were not given jobs, etc. So she had to struggle throughout her life. And, but uh, she's still very, very famous for her work, not just in in physics. It shows up in Noether's theorem, but in algebra, there is something called Noetherian rings and stuff like that. Don't ask me what those things are. I just know the names. Okay, so she's a very, very famous uh, women mathematician. Okay, and... Uh, Hopefully today we can have more women with much more ease. They can get jobs at least. Okay. So we will come back to this uh, theorem at a later point in this course. And uh, let's do a second. Uh, so, in this, uh, so in this example uh, where Lagrangian is half m x dot square, the Lagrangian is also independent of time, right? So yeah. the independence of time and the independence of x will lead, to, uh, lead us to the same constant of motion? No, it doesn't. So yeah, that's correct. So good, great question actually. So, so let us go, come back and look at this. So, energy would be p square upon 2m, right? Yes. So, okay, so, in this example, energy, which is also a constant of motion, is p square upon 2m, okay? And, uh, but, uh, yeah, so, so if p is constant, then, uh, so these two are not independent of each other. Because E is completely determined given p, the value of p. OK, but there is an interesting thing. Just consider uh, now that uh, that the, uh, the particle is in a one dimensional box with some walls, OK, uh, elastic walls. In this situation, at the wall, what happens? You know, it'll, uh, uh, particle will hit it with momentum P and then it will change sign. Right. It's an elastic collision. It will go to minus P. 
So E will be a constant of motion, but P won't be a constant of motion because you don't have translation invariance in that example. Right? If you translate some amount, you'll go out of the box while the particle is forced to remain inside the box. Is my point clear? So can you explain a little bit more? So if you have a free particle in a box, restricted to be inside a box, you will use the same Lagrangian, right? You'll write half mv square, L equal to half mx dot square, but there'll be a boundary condition. The condition is that, uh, the, the, the condition is that it will remain inside the box. So that's a constraint. And so when, uh, so when it is away from the wall, the particle will be fine. It will be moving with constant P. But any time it encounters the wall, P will change sign. Right? I mean, if this is a wall and it's coming like this with momentum P, after it hits the wall, it will come out like this with minus P. Yeah, so in this case, uh, energy is constant, but uh, P is not, right? Uh, P is not. Okay. okay. So, yeah. So I just wanted to contrast this whole story. Okay. So, sir, will we not write a steep potential term in the Lagrangian? Yeah. So, I mean, you. So there are two ways of doing it. We can say that there is a potential which is zero inside the box and infinity outside. So, uh, do we need so to apply? So, uh, wait, wait. Let Bidhi finish her thing. Bidhi, go ahead. Yes, sir. So, do we need to apply the constant uh, part in the Lagrangian? Like no, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So that's what uh, we are discussing. So either you can put it as a potential, which is infinity outside the box, but it's much simpler to say it's restricted uh, x with x values within the box, and uh, the uh, and uh, and then uh, uh, and the the constraint force is that it uh, that the wall acts like a re perfect reflector. So that's all. That's simpler. So in some, so that's what I'm saying. It's a fake thing that uh, Lagrangian looks like half mx dot square, but it's not translationally invariant because there is really restriction that it be inside the box. Yeah. So someone else was asking a question. Please. Yeah, it is fine, sir. It clarified my doubt also. Okay. Very good. Okay. Sir. Mm, go ahead. I want to ask one more thing. Uh, how did we land it at p x is equal to del? L by uh, dou Q. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the proof of that? How we define? We defined it like this, or is there any proof? This is definition. Okay. Okay, and it's called momentum because in the simple cases it matches with your momentum. In this, this is the only simple case <laughs> where it matches with what you call momentum. Okay, so we'll do one more case where. Okay, so I want to do one more. So and now in two dimensions. Okay, so the kinetic energy is half m x dot square plus y dot square. But I also want to write it in spherical polar coordinates and then it will be half m rho dot square plus uh, rho square phi dot square. So we had done this exercise, exercise in problem two, I think, right, in PS3. Okay, so I want a potential. And I'll say the potential is only a function of rho. So L is kinetic energy minus. This is not the most general Lagrangian, by the way, but I'm just writing something. Okay. So, so now, uh, so now uh, we can see here that uh, what we see here is that uh, uh, so there are two degrees of freedom, and the coordinates are rho and phi. But uh, one coordinate does not appear in the Lagrangian. Which one? Phi. Okay. So phi, so it doesn't appear. So we will say phi is a cyclic coordinate. It doesn't appear. I'm introducing notation here. Okay. It doesn't matter if you, I'm, I'm the worst guy to remember terms, but I always remember the physics. Okay. So what does that mean? P phi is DL by d phi dot is a constant of motion. So we let's look at L. So phi dot comes here. So this is the term. So you get m rho square phi dot. Okay, it's a constant of motion. Okay. 
Okay, now what is the symmetry? Phi you can shift. Phi lives on a circle, but you can shift by any amount. So here is a case. So this is a constant of motion. And uh, what is this object? Angular. Yeah. Okay. So this is just there's only one in 2D. There's only one component, LZ component. I'll just call it L. So now you can see that the can the the momentum canonically conjugate to to phi is p phi is not linear momentum, but this is angular momentum. Okay. Further, this is one constant of motion. But there's a second constant of motion we can get here. And what is that? Energy. Energy, exactly. So that because you no know, independence of time. So we can write it as, uh, you know, E equal to P phi phi dot minus, uh, sorry, plus P rho rho dot. We need to work out P rho. I leave it P rho is, I believe, N rho dot. Minus L is a constant of is a constant of is another constant. Okay, it turns out so now we have two degrees of freedom, and each one will let you. Uh, so first thing you can see here is that uh, first equal first guy here uh, will let you replace phi dot with p phi, and that's a constant of motion. Okay, and uh, then this equation will let you solve for rho dot in terms of rho. You can get this, so you can actually integrate this explicitly. Okay, so you get two constants of motion, and uh, okay, so so these are some examples. And uh, so the question is, uh, so these are simple systems. So the question to ask is, how do we This is somebody asked last time itself, Lagrangians, in the first place. How do we figure out? Okay, so, so, so no, yeah. So uh, we had two constant of motion. Uh, yes. So uh, corresponding to ha it we have a single symmetry or uh, no there are two i mean one is uh, P, uh, so both of so both of here uh, here the symmetry for two for energy is time translation okay but time translation is slightly different in the sense that it acts on the boundaries of uh, your integral so you need to so that's also fits into another theorem so that's also there so it says that if you take t if you do your thing at time t or t plus some shifted by some t naught the thing will be the same. Okay. So, okay, so both, uh, both, both these examples fit into Noether's theorem. But second one is slightly more intricate. I think there's sometimes they call Noether's theorem of first kind and second kind. I don't distinguish. Okay. But when you actually write the proof, you need to. Okay. So, so let us, uh, let us start uh, with a way, with a beautiful example actually. We have a free particle. moving in space. Free means no forces, nothing in space. Okay. Now, what are the, uh, okay, and we will assume, we will assume that space is homogeneous. Okay. In other words, it doesn't matter where your origin is in space. You can be at one point, you move to another point, etc. Okay, so this space is three dimensions for simplicity. So you can go from one place to another. So it doesn't matter. So that is a uh, thing. So the Lagrangian, so, so, you know, let's write it like this. X goes to X plus A shouldn't matter. Okay, so that means translations in space, space should be asymmetric. This is a homogeneity condition. The second condition is isotropy. Okay, that means no preferred direction.
So you pick an origin and it doesn't matter where you look. So you can rotate. Okay, so this is a kind of symmetry under rotations, arbitrary rotations. So we'll ask, can we write a Lagrangian which has these two symmetries? Okay, so now you're going to help me. So originally we would have written L as a function of X and X dot. Okay, so first we'll impose one. So this is a, this is a general case. Now question to you is what does one imply? The Lagrangian should be independent of X. Okay. So implies L is a function of X dot. Very good. Now we impose two. What does two imply? Can we say directly that angular momentum is conserved? No, no. No angular momentum, nothing. We are just asking what is the action or the Lagrangian in this case, not just we not yet got that. The Lagrangian is independent of phi. What is phi? So it should be a function of mod x dot. Yeah. Mod x is not an analytic function. So, okay. So implies it should be a function. It should be a function of a scalar. Okay, so let us look at v square, which would be x dot dot. It can't be a vector function. So L has to be a scalar. Okay, then so we get so this implies L is a function of v square. And remember, I am not taking v because v involves a square root or as somebody said mod whatever. Okay, so it has to be a function of v square. So isotropy and homogeneity implies that L should be only a function of V square for a free particle. Is this argument clear? Okay, so so this argument uh, I have borrowed from uh, I learned this from Landau and Lifshitz. So it's very very clever. But I'm going to be even more clever and tell you, okay, so, so now, uh, so the, so the LL argument continues this way. So L is a function of V square, so we can just expand it as a Taylor series. So we'll write it as L equal to some constant, boring, plus DL by DV square. So you can, plus alpha V square plus order v power 4. This is what, you know, and alpha we can identify with half n to match our convention. So, and if you neglect these terms, you get L equal to half m v square, which is exactly the kinetic energy for a free particle. Is this clear? Sir, how did we take alpha equals to 1 by 2 m? That's just there to match some convention. I can really, re I can redefine alpha to be half m. And we ignored L naught? L naught is a constant you can always, uh, so uh, you can always uh, get rid of it. It is not. It's a, it doesn't change equations of motion. Nothing. It's like adding a constant to the action. So it's boring. But this can be neglected. That means nothing. Okay. Good. Oh, okay. Hmm? okay. So this so, is. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. At least at this level. But uh, uh, we can fast forward to so the you know. And so you could make arguments that, you know, maybe this is, uh, you know, for small v or whatever, this is the dominant term, etc., etc. But there is, uh, but uh, what happens in special relativity? Okay. 
Okay. So this still holds. Okay. Except what you get there, L turns out to be minus M. Uh, I have to put some dimensional stuff here. MC square into square root of 1 minus V square upon C square. Okay, so if you expand, so this is what you get. And you can see that uh, it does not violate this final conclusion that we have. It's some complicated function. It gives you a given function. Okay, and uh, how do we identify this particle? Uh, this thing is just, uh, is this correct? Is it MC square or MC? Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay, so it, there's an additional parameter. C is the speed of light. Okay, it's just a free parameter. In special relativity, we have one more parameter. So now, if you go ahead and do Taylor expansion of this, you will get minus m c square plus half m v square plus order v power four. So this is what we called L naught. Okay, so in special relativity, uh, m c square has some meaning. Okay. But uh, key is that uh, is that uh, this is Newtonian mechanics. OK, so. And uh, what special relativity tells you is that it tells you not just these two terms, it gives you all orders correction. So it's a very, very strong statement. So, but now we can ask in special relativity, what is the Meaning of what is momentum in special relativity? You can ask this question. Right? So how would I define? So be the question for you. How should I define momentum? Say X component of momentum. We can uh, define it by uh, del L by del X dot. dot. Absolutely correct. Okay. So we can just define the X to be DL by x dot okay so if you just go ahead and do this computation this will become one by square root of one minus v square upon c square times m x dot similarly you can so this is just a calculation so but now we can see that uh, the definition that we have for momentum is much more general and uh, so this is uh, so the fact that here in this action, there is no x dependence. Will still imply that p x is a constant of motion. This p x. Okay. So what we do is is that if spatial any constant of motion which is associated with translations in space, we just call that guy as momentum, linear momentum or whatever. Okay. So this is what we get. You don't have this thing. So, so this is the power. Of the Lagrangian of the Lagrangian description, it is. It, you know that uh, I mean, neither Euler nor Lagrange had heard of special theory of relativity because it came, you know, hundreds of years after after them. Right. But they were interested in giving a very very general formulation and you can see that their formulation is general enough to capture uh, you know even the special theory of relativity fits into that mechanics you know relativistic mechanics okay it fits into that and uh, even though we may not understand where this is coming out about right now we will in this course later but uh, what i'm saying is that it uh, even without understanding it we can just quickly we can do some calculations. We see something interesting. And of course, uh, folklore will tell you that, uh, you know, speed uh, X dot cannot exceed C. OK, but if you look at momentum, you will see that when speed comes to close to C, denominator of this, this guy goes to infinity. So momentum is unbounded, even though speeds are bounded. OK, so this is something we is just some trivial mathematical cal calculation without content. Because there is more content in special theory of relativity, which we will see. Okay, so this is uh, 
So I just wanted to illustrate uh, this thing for you. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, go ahead. How this PX uh, become, how this uh, del L by del X dot become this expression in the right? Uh, because I, I just take derivatives of the cell. Derivative of the, of, of the cell. This first expression. Yeah. This okay. is a Lagrangian in, in uh, relativistic mechanics, special relativistic or relativistic mechanics. Not Newton. This is Newton. This is relativistic mechanics. Okay. So, but this second yeah. formula here is to just show you that Einstein did not prove Newton wrong, but rather he extended Newton's uh, equations to a larger, uh, you know, arena where, you know, high, uh, even for high speeds where it's comparable to the speed of light, this, this thing will hold. Okay. So, I mean, the point of this is that it's just that it's just a, you just say that momentum is a constant of motion associated with translation and variance in the x direction. End of story. Okay. So, uh, before I proceed, I want to also do some little bit of dimensional analysis. Okay. So, so dimension of say x coordinate is length. Okay. And what about dimension of say the x component of linear momentum is m x dot so l t inverse. Okay. You understand the square bracket notation, right? From high school you should know this. The physical dimensions of things, right? So now I'm taking the physical dimension of X and multiplying with this. Okay. So this is just a uh, trivial computation. You will see in a moment why, where I'm getting it. Okay. So now if you look at this guy, this has the same as dimension, physical dimensions of angular momentum, which is R cross P, right? So same as that but there's also it's also the physical dimension of uh, Planck's constant h or h bar h bar is just h upon 2 pi okay so so here comes the interesting thing is that uh, we want, uh, you know, let's say that uh, T is some P, uh, P X, X dot minus L, okay, say some constant of motion. But this we know as dimensions of energy. Okay. And uh, so does. So now we just look if, if we are going to say that this is going to have dimensions of energy, uh, uh, which is the same as saying it is, uh, you know, uh, what is it? It is. Uh, so this will also imply that this has same physical dimensions as energy. Okay. And uh, so, but what is there for energy? It is Pxx, which is ml square. T minus 2, right? Is this correct, what I've done? Yeah. So, physical dimensions of energy, which is the same as physical dimensions of L. I'm just doing some simple calculations. Now, what is the physical dimensions of S? It is integral dTL. So, T will give 1 T times dimension of L. Okay, so uh, let's make a table, whatever, whatever it says. 
So what I wanted to compute was physical dimension of x and physical dimension of px is m l square t minus 1. Physical dimension of action is also m l square t minus 1. Physical dimension of h bar is m l square t minus 1. Okay. Everybody agrees with this. So right hand side is the same for all the guys in every row. Any comments, questions? Okay. So is now? there any, uh, sir, I have a question. I had a question. Hmm. Uh, uh, is there any deep reason that why their uh, dimensions are similar? I mean, yeah, yeah we are getting to that. We are getting to that. That's the point. Okay. That's his point. Absolutely. Okay. So, so now the now comes the thing is that we so here this first uh, row is only linear general uh, Cartesian coordinate and px. But now we can ask. So claim is the following. We can is that. It's always true. Okay. And so how, how, how do we prove it? We know how L is there, right? So P is defined to be DL by DQ dot, right? This is the for the conjugate momentum, conjugate to Q. That has the same as this. So uh, this thing of P is the same as uh, this thing divided by q dot. Okay, so we can just show q dot times p is the same as l. And now q dot, I can remove the dot or l times t, which is the same as action. Okay, so what we see is that the physical dimension, so conclusion, the physical dimensions of a coordinate, a generalized coordinate, times the physical dimension of its conjugate momentum is always m, whatever that thing is, right? What is it? m l square t minus 1. Okay, is this point clear? So, so it's a little bizarre. I mean, we saw an example, right? When Q was uh, angle, then P was, uh, P5 was uh, angular momentum, but then angular mom uh, but which is the same as the dimension of S or H bar, etc. So, Q is, uh, angle is dimensionless. So, again, everything works. Okay, so this is a very, very cute statement. And, uh, so what is so deep about it? Okay, so let's uh, uh, let's understand that. Okay, so uh, so first thing is that uh, uh, since S and H bar, so the quantity S upon H bar is dimensionless, right? Because S and H are uh, same, they have both the same, they are the uh, same as angular momentum, so this is right. Okay, so Feynman, uh, so Feynman, if that, if you give me a path, this is the probability of Q of T some path, which say goes from uh, the usual thing, Q of 0 and Q of T are given, are fixed. 
Okay. And he said in quantum mechanics, you won't go only through the uh, uh, classical equation. This will be proportional to E power. Okay. There is some I here, but don't worry. Okay. So this was his great contribution. So this is one uh, great application of uh, this thing. Second application, again, this is in quantum mechanics. So whatever I need, see, here is the deal, right? Uh, these constants are uh, important in the following sense. So when there, when a C comes into some equations, you expect special relativity to come into effect. Similarly, quantum effects are controlled by H bar. Okay. So I, uh, so again, uh, so there is uh, Heisenberg as an uncertainty principle. Okay, it says something like this. It doesn't matter what we are going to. Okay, it's greater than or equal to some h by two or h bar by two. I forget. Doesn't matter. What I am saying here is that uh, we have a coordinate and it's canonically conjugate things. Some variance in that or something. And that, uh, so the product of these two guys has the same dimension as uh, Planck's constant. So again, this equation makes sense. Okay. So, and here also we needed, uh, uh, so, uh, argument of an exponential should be dimensionless. And so h bar is just this dimension full parameter, which makes it this thing. So, so this is uh, this, uh, so, so here are two cases where there is actually some meaning which I can give, but not in classical mechanics, but I need to go beyond classical mechanics to uh, to make sense of this table. Okay, where I will actually add this last line. Okay, so so uh, so even though we are sitting there and doing, uh, you know, kind of uh, simple uh, bookkeeping, right? I mean, physical dimensions is only bookkeeping. We get something quite interesting, which connects up with uh, quantum mechanics, someday you will see this, uh, the path integral approach, and definitely you will see the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so, so you would expect something like this, you know, more generally delta Q, delta P should be again similar to some H by two or H by two, I forget to you. I should know, but okay. <laughs> something like this. Okay, so uh, I think I'm done for today. So, so we we can see that if you put in some symmetries, etc., it gives you constraints on uh, on what the uh, what the action can be, and we saw even for the case of a uh, for a free particle, it doesn't give you the full answer. It says it will be some function of v square. It doesn't tell you anything more. Okay, and then you need to make some approximations and to uh, approximations to get say Newton's equations or you need to have some more deep insight from something else which will give you the full function okay like we got here okay so I'll stop so so uh, going back to that uh, thing Feynman proposed it is saying that the probability to uh, follow a particular path q of t between q of 0 and Q of capital T is proportional to e to the yeah. power i s q by h cut means we are yeah. uh, plugging in Q of T in uh, yeah that so that's a number so so once you yeah you give me a path so he says you take any path okay and uh, he argues that the dominant contribution so will come so you want to evaluate this and you want to evaluate you want h bar if you think h bar is very very small that's something called saddle point okay. We, we, I, I don't know if you will discuss this in this course, but some course you will see this. You will see that the most probable guy is what we call classical trajectory. Okay, so classical trajectory, in Feynman's story, the classical trajectory has the dominant contribution. That's all. Okay. Sir, this uh, thing in the right hand side in this mm -hmm. exponential, this is mm -hmm. complex. So, uh, the probability being proportional to a complex quantity, what does it mean? I, I cannot understand if it is 
proportionate. Yeah, le- no, no, let's not. Well. Yeah, I mean, really, uh, there is a whole story to go with this. So let's not. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. I won't. Also, sir, uh, if it's if, actually if, not probability, it's probability amplitude. Okay, so mod square of it. So uh, that is the answer. Okay, if you know what that is, <laughs> it's not probability. It's probability amplitude. So yeah, I should write this. This is probability amplitude, which can be complex, and mod square of it is usually the probability. Okay. Uh, also, sir, uh, we so say complex that. So complex is allowed. Uh, also, we say that uh, the system takes the path which has the least action. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So if uh, if s is uh, minimum for a path, the probability Mm-hmm. Will the probability amplitude be maximum for this? See, problem? actually, no. The, the, there is a situation where this can be made better um, because you are objecting, which is a very valid objection. Okay. Suppose instead I had something like this. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then all your objections will go away. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So, sir, in the definition of the Lagrangian, you consider only v square. If we consider v to the power four, that would also be invariant under any rotation. Yeah, yeah. So the general answer, absolutely correct. So I said that. No, our arguments did not tell you. Uh, yeah, I said that l equal to l of v square, arbitrary function. Absolutely. Why do we neglect? Do not consider v to the power four and higher terms. That's my question. You can. I mean, so the point is that you want to consider the first term, first non-vanishing term, and that you expect to be order v square, and that's all. So I kept only. That is one possible Lagrangian. Another way we we can also choose yeah. v to the power. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, there are uh, weird systems where these kind of things happen, but not for every particle. that is true and we will see in general considerations we will restrict ourselves to two derivative what we will call two time derivatives okay so let me just stop recording